Hello everyone, welcome to This Family Who Does Everything. My name is Alexandria. This is one part of the trial. I found that I could actually add a few of the documents to. This is the part where Daryl Brooks gets 50 full minutes to make all his claims. So let's sit back, watch, and analyze the Daryl Brooks trial. All right, we are back on the record. Then appearances are as they were before. State have their next witness available. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> All right, let's bring the jury back out. I don't uh, consent to being called by the name that this court chooses to identify me by. Um, I want to state for the record that I'm here as a third party interviewer on special appearance on behalf of my client. Can that be noted for the record? Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Daryl Brooks Jr. Um, here for this matter without prejudice by special appearance. It was noted this morning. May it be noted again for the record so that we can keep the record clear and accurate. The appearances are as they were this morning. They are no different. Bring the jury up. And we have yet to address subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor. We still haven't. I still haven't been shown any verified proof that All rise. this court has subject matter jurisdiction. And at this point, may I request an affidavit that you, Your Honor, have no bias, no conflict of interest, and no interest in the outcome of this case? Mr. Brooks, the jury's coming out. We'll address your legal issues later, if I deem them appropriate. Judge, do you hold the full Mr. judicial Brooks, power please, of the state, or is please, this the military right, can power? Can you please take the jury out? Thank you. Do you hold the full Mr. Brooks, jurisdiction? Mr. Brooks, just wait until the jury's out, please. I ask that you show that respect. I, I will. I will. Thank you. Yeah. can be seated. Mr. Brooks, just make your statements. What do you want to advise the court today? I want to first state again for the record that I do not identify by that name, nor do I consent to being called that name. Uh, Your Honor, um, with all respect, uh, I'm merely asking you, do you have the full judicial power of the state or is this military power? I'm sorry? I don't understand what you're asking me, sir. I'm asking, is on this... On what legal basis are you I'm, making I'm, that request? I'm asking, for the record, is this a common law, common, common law court or an admiralty court? What, what, what are we in here? And I'm, I'm requesting an affidavit that you, Your Honor, have no bias, no conflict of interest, or no interest in the outcome of this case. Um, and the reason why I'm, I want to state this clearly for the record um, mainly is because of the bias that's been shown. Um, I have not been getting any uh, certified copies of any requests that I've made, which I was told by this court to uh, address inmate communication forms for anything that I that I may need. I've done that. I've complied with that. Every time I've needed something of the court pertaining to documents, I've done it the way the court has asked me. And I've always stated that I wanted everything to be certified. I have yet to even get that. My um my court docket sheet was not a certified copy. Um when I asked your honor um, of your oath of office, I asked for that to be certified. You stated for the record that you would not give me a certified copy of your oath of office, which you are required to show if I ask for it. I've, I've brought up um, my Sixth Amendment constitutional right that 
has been pretty much discarded. And that is based on the fact that I have the right to face my accuser, which would be the plaintiff, state of Wisconsin, in this matter. They have yet to show that a claim is, 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 I mean, a living human being can only make a claim. An entity cannot make a claim. I've requested, uh, for the complaint to be provided. The complaint from November 23 of 2021. The amended complaint from November 29th of 2021. The second amended complaint from January 12th of, of this year, 2022. I have yet to see those. Um, there was no record of a bond in my docket sheet. I'm asking that I ask for that to be verified by proof. That hasn't been provided. There's so many, um, biases, clear biases in, 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 in questions that are not being asked based on judicial determinations made by your honor. Um, you look at the discrepancies and, and I think they're clear. Um, I think at minimum I deserve for the subject matter jurisdiction to be verified and proven. I've raised that issue numerous times, pretty much every day, every time I, I, I come before your court, Your Honor, I, I address that, and it has yet to be proven. Uh, my filings have been disregarded, even though they've been filed into the record, even though they've been time stamped. I haven't got the original copies of, of any of them, which I'm supposed to get. Um, and as we sit here today, I, I, I'm still not even understanding the nature and cause of the of the charges that hasn't even been proven can that be provided in any way I'm, I'm i'm basically sitting here confused because i don't understand why these proceedings are are allowed to continue when there's so many things that have not been provided they haven't been provided in my discovery they haven't been provided to me by uh being brought to my uh pile where i'm housed in the jail I'm without so much information, valid information to this matter. And, and I believe that it should be verified and it should be proven for the record. And if not, I move for this case to be dismissed for failure to appear by the plaintiff and failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted. Everything that I'm saying it has merit and it has validity. As we see here today, I'm still... Uh, being charged with charges that shouldn't even exist based on the testimony that we've heard for the last few days. There's so many things left to still be proven. The The prosecution team hasn't even proven that they're licensed to practice law in Wisconsin. Are, they haven't proven are they just bar association uh, uh, members or do they have state issued licenses? That has not been proven, which I've raised that issue for the record. I'm not even sure if that was even recorded in the docket sheet. There's so many things and, and your honor, you still haven't stated for the record if you have full judicial power of the state or is this military power? That hasn't been proven. Nothing is nothing has been proven. Not subject matter jurisdiction, not licenses to practice law. My Sixth Amendment right has been basically trampled over. No complaints have, have been sh shown. Neither of the three that I've requested, by the way that you told me to request them by in inmate communication, um, nothing is certified that I, that I get copies of when I clearly ask for them to be certified and to be filed into the record. Uh, it's, it's to the point where I... Your Honor, you should you should rec recuse yourself from the from the pre uh, presiding at this point. If you're not going to um, abide by the oath that you swore, which was in your oath, correct? You swore to protect the Constitution of the United States. You swore to protect we the people. That is not being done here. If 
every valid argument that I raised is, is, is taken by the court as a sign of disrespect or a sign of trying to intentionally be disruptive or, or uh, causing a problem when I'm merely seeking understanding because I don't understand. I'm merely seeking to understand why this information has yet to be provided and we're this far into this matter. And there's still no verified proof. Even as I'm sitting out saying this, there's still no proof being provided. N zero. How is this case allowed to continue without these uh, documents and filings being verified? Is there any legal factual basis that, that can state why this information is, has not been provided? Why the docket sheet is incorrect why there's so much on the docket sheet that should be on record that's not even in there that if we had the the uh the recordings of the record they would see was brought up numerous times that that doesn't even show up i'm, I'm just i'm just asking for your honor to be fair which is another right that i have the right to a fair trial and the right to an impartial jury It's, I can go on and on and on about what's not what's not being done. I have, again, I, I, I say I have the right to face my accuser. Where's where's the injured party? Who's who's making the claim? I asked your honor numerous times for your honor's name. You wouldn't answer. I asked, did you have a claim against me? You did not answer. I asked the whole courtroom, did anyone have a claim against me? No one said anything which you stated for the record a non-responsive answer a non-responsive answer is is an agreement which will be a tactic agreement by you your honor that you don't have to answer these questions that you should be answering i have that right the the plaintiff in this matter which was stated by witnesses in testimony to be the state of wisconsin but when I ask, do they see the state of Wisconsin present in the courtroom? The question is shut down, which is a valid question. The plaintiff should be present in this matter. Where is the plaintiff? Who's bringing the who's bringing the claim? Because we know an entity can't bring a claim. It has to be a living, breathing human being. No one is stated for the record if they're the injured party. Not your honor. Not the prosecutors, not anyone in the court has stated to be an injured party in this matter. No one. Not one person. I have the right to demand that the court place in the evidence any unrevealed contract. Has that been provided to me? Have that been placed in the evidence? I would like to see it. Which is my right. I have the right to inform the jury about the truth in their duty, in their rights. That's the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. But I'm repeatedly told to shut the question down when this is valuable information that the jury should be privileged to know. They deserve to know. Once they were chosen to sit on this jury, why are we keeping information away from them? That they deserve to know. They ultimately have the power. They decide. The matter. Why are we keeping information. Valuable information from their knowledge. That's that's a disservice to the jury. And frankly it's a dis disservice to the court. That they're not allowed to hear things. That they should know. That they should be informed of. It's our right. To inform them of everything that they have the power to know, to do and to know. They deserve that much. It would, it would be, it would be a travesty for them to make a decision without being fully informed. And these are all valid, valid things. I have the right to protest and object if any of my rights or demands are not being met. I've done that numerous times only to be shut down. Numerous times. I've raised 
uh, the, the issues that I didn't consent to anything that may have been suggested on behalf of my former attorneys. I've never even consented to them making a plea on my behalf. I haven't, as a matter of fact, when it comes to a plea, I haven't even had the, the opportunity to entertain any plea that may have been suggested by the prosecution. We haven't even, we haven't even talked about that. Not one time was it ever brought to my attention that the prosecution even wanted to offer a plea. That's another issue. I have the right to challenge the jurisdiction of this court, which I've done numerous times. I have the right to demand that the code be construed in harmony with the common law. I just raised that. I'm constantly referred to as pro se when I've raised the issue that I'm pro per. I have the right to conduct my defense pro per free from professional restrictions imposed upon licensed attorneys, which this court is well aware that I am not a licensed attorney. In fact, the court is also aware that I only had three days to prepare for a trial that the prosecution has been, pre been prepared for for a whole year. We see these boxes right here. This box alone is 45 or 50 pounds full of so much information. I, 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 I haven't even gone through half of it. It was stated for the record that the discovery the in its entirety was brung to my housing unit on the 29th of September which trial was scheduled that would be a Thursday which trial was scheduled for Monday how can I possibly go through all that all the paperwork all the the uh, digital discovery and, 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 and things of that nature how can I go through all of that and be prepared in three days that's a clear bias. I did not have time to prepare for this. Everything I'm doing is off the top of my head, winging it, taking it as it comes. When the court is well aware that I was not prepared, I raised the issue that it should be an adjournment, at least at the minimum it should be an adjournment because of that fact. At least to let me go through all the discovery. That was denied. No valid reason was stated for that when your honor knew there is no possible way, humanly possible, that I could be ready for a trial of this magnitude in three days. That's clear bias. I have the right to face the injured party claiming damages. That's under Article 3 and the Sixth Amendment. I raised that issue again. Where's the injured party? Is the injured party present in, in, in court right now? Can anyone can anyone make a claim against me? Can you make a claim against me, Your Honor? Do you know of anyone that can make a claim against me, Your Honor? Can anyone right now in court, anyone, make a claim against me? And because of that, Your Honor, the motion to dismiss should be granted based on that alone. There's there's no injured party in this matter. So who makes the claim? Who? I have the right to put the judge on notice of my intent to appeal in any ruling decisions during the case. You stated for the record that I would have to wait until the appealing process, but it, my right is that I can raise that issue during the case, which I've attempted to do. That's been shut down. I have the right to specifically reserve all of my rights, which I do at the beginning. I have the right to say what I want and to be heard under the First Amendment. And when I attempt to do that, it's taken as a slight to the court, a disrespect to the court, or me intentionally coming into the court to be disrespectful, which I've stated that that is not my intention. Never, never is it my intention. 
I never intend to walk into your courtroom, Your Honor, and be disrespectful intentionally. I never come into this courtroom to disrespect anyone. But because I don't understand, I raise these issues because they have validity. I have the right to object to any statement made by the judge or the prosecution. I've done that and been repeatedly shut down. Without a, without a, uh, without a lawful explanation. I've, I've repeatedly asked the court for a, a, a motion for a finding of fact to determine if things are being done legally. I've been denied that numerous times without merit, which is also my right. I have the right to recuse the judge at any time, which is also a right. I have the right to a speedy and fair trial by impartial jury. I think it's safe to say that my speedy trial right has definitely been violated because this matter has been taking place for roughly a year. I've never consented to waiving anything related to a speedy trial. And if that was done, it was done without my consent or without my knowledge. We're way past the speedy trial date, way past when the uh, change of venue motion was was brought up, I believe that was the first time I came before your honor in, in early March. I, I want to say March 11th of this year when uh, the uh, change of venue motion came into play. It was decided by your honor that that wouldn't be decided until uh, the 20th of June, I believe. That's that's over the 90 day mark right there for a speedy trial. That was denied and, and I, I, I still don't understand how that was denied when it's, when it's clearly obvious that at minimum the venue should have been changed based on the fact of the magnitude of the matter. There's no possible way Anyone in this county would not have some type of connection or some type of knowledge, whether they were um, told something by someone that they may know. Uh, the news reporting alone, just that alone, there's no way that this trial should be taking place in Waukesha County. That, that's obvious. That's obvious from the way the motion was presented, the coverage alone, the, the political campaign ads that plastered the defendant's face all over the TV every single day. Every time a political uh, campaign was brought up, it made reference to this incident. Every single time. The fact that uh, people have children that go to the same schools in this county, that people may have worked with the same people in this county. You yourself, Your Honor, uh, uh, stated that you at one time worked with the father of one of the people that, that was injured in this matter. That is a clear conflict, conflict of interest right there. You also stated for the record that not only did you work uh, with, with this father, but that uh, at one time they may have donated to uh, your, I don't know if it was to you becoming a judge or uh, I, I would have to look through the docket, but you said it on the record that they donated money to uh, a cause of yours. You also stated that when you had gained knowledge of the incident and that their family member was injured in the incident, that you reached out via phone. I don't recall if it was text message or an actual phone conversation, but you put that on the record. 
You also stated that the nature of your relationship was strictly professional. I don't know about you, Your Honor, but I've I've worked numerous jobs and I know what professional relationships is and personal relationships. I've never had the cell phone number of anyone that was a, a personal relationship saved to my phone that I could reach out immediately when I learned something. That would constitute a personal relationship of some kind. Whether whether hanging out from time to time, having a cup of coffee or hanging out time from time, grabbing a beer or hanging out from time to time, watching a game or or or, or anything of that nature. It would it would definitely be more than just strictly professional. That was stated for the record. Um, again, I go back to the Sixth Amendment again. In terms of when I asked for the the uh, the motion for uh, the evidence motion that I raised, that was denied without any explanation. That would be strictly to uh, place in the evidence any unrevealed contract. That's under the Sixth Amendment. Clearly, there's been repeated, repeated, and repeated violations of my Sixth Amendment. We all know that the United States Constitution is the law of the land, period. It trumps everything. We also know that any law repugnant of the Constitution is null and void. We know that. There's still there's still no no basis for the motions being shot down. Why was I why was I not granted the motion for finding a fact? Why did it take so long for me to be brought my entire motion for discovery? Why was the motion to prove jurisdiction? Not verified. Why was why was the motion to dismiss the case for all the reasons I said not being granted? Which brings me to the motion to subpoena witnesses. I did everything that was asked of me by the court pertaining those subpoenas. It was understood by the court that this is my first time ever having to do this. Um. I didn't understand how to properly, pro properly fill out the subpoenas at which the prosecution volunteered that they would give assistance. The only assistance I received was for them to check to see if it was filled out right. That was it. That, that doesn't amount to any assistance. I was still left to fill it out on my own. And then when I did that, correction still had to be made, which would verify what I was saying. I don't know how to do this. But I still complied to what the court asked of me. And even then, it was a big old thing about the subpoenas. I can't subpoena the plaintiff in the case. Well, how can I not subpoena the plaintiff in the case when under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to face my accuser, which is the plaintiff of the case. So how, how could... How could the subpoena not be filed and how could the plaintiff not be called to the witness stand? That begs the question of does the plaintiff even exist? Which it was stated for the record that not only by a, a witness, a detective, Detective Casey that got on the stand and said on the record that is an entity which is not a living, breathing human being. And then it was stated again by you on the record, Your Honor, that the plaintiff is an entity. So the question still stands, how can an entity bring a claim if it's not a living human being? So where's the claim? Will, will the the plaintiff in this matter, the state of Wisconsin, be allowed to testify? Would they be allowed to be in the courtroom? 
No, they will not because they don't exist. Therefore, the claim doesn't exist. For all those reasons that I just stated, the case should have been dismissed a long time ago. Once those issues were raised, this case should have been dismissed. And at the very minimum, it should have been di dismissed because those still have yet to be proven. We're still talking about jurisdiction. That's been being asked for over a week. There's still no, no providing of license to practice law yet. Not even by you, Your Honor. Why was I not provided with a certified copy of your oath of office? Why, why would you not state the name that is on file with the Secretary of the State? Or I made reference the first time to the Secretary of the Treasury and then you stated on the record that it's the Secretary of State. Even though you knew what I was referring to when I asked. You referred to your name tag. But that's not the name registered. We both know that. So why wasn't that proof verified? You gave me a, a copy of your oath of office, but it's not certified. So how can I verify that it, that is the true oath of office that you signed? How can I verify that it, that is that is valid? That's the reason why I asked for it to be certified, which you stated for the record, you will not do that. You never stated any uh, legal reason why. I have the right to ask for that legally. I also have the right to call any witnesses to assist my defense, which is the main reason why I subpoenaed the plaintiff in this matter. I also have the right to challenge all relevant laws in this trial in terms of their intent, interpretation, fairness, enforcement, and whether they serve and protect the people. From my uh, knowledge, the, the design of the statutes of the law was written for the common people to understand. So that would mean the final determination or interpretation of what the law says comes down to the people. You know this, Your Honor. Are you or are you not a public servant? You also know that this docket sheet is inaccurate. Every filing up until the point that I started representing myself was filed in a name that was represented by all capital letters, which is not my name, nor has it ever been my name, nor have I ever seen that name or individual. Um, yeah, uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Daryl Brooks Jr. Um, here for this matter without prejudice by special appearance. Every single filing or paperwork was all in capital letters. Ever since September 29th, roughly around there, now everything starts to go to lowercase letters. Why is that? What, what prompted the sudden change?
I still have filings that have all capital letters. Which I state every time I come into your courtroom, Your Honor, that that is not my name, nor do I consent or agree to being called that name. I'm merely here as a third party intervener on behalf of my client. Did I accept for value and return for value? I, we go through this every every time I every time I come here. Every time. You bring the uh, Illinois versus Allen when we had the issue of me being removed from the courtroom. We went through that where Illinois versus Allen states that there are three options when a defendant is being disruptive in court. You stated for the record that you identified a fourth one, which is not cited anywhere in that case. It's not cited anywhere. So the question would be, how did you come up with a fourth option that's not written in that case? Did you take it upon yourself to add this fourth option to justify denying me my constitutional right by being present? You could have done the three that were stated. Any one of the three you could have done that were stated in the case. Nowhere does it say you can create a, a fourth option. Not, uh, not upholding my constitutional rights. I'm sure you know about Title 18, USCS 2381. Which states that it's treason not to uphold your oath of office. Treason. You repeatedly make judicial determinations that clearly prejudice in, uh, uh, my defense. And then when I question you about are you making judicial determinations, I'm repeatedly shut down. Which leads to today the constant push not to have an informed jury not given legal valid grounds on objections not noting objections for the record to make sure that the record is clear I'm sure somewhere in the jury instructions, you informed them that the state of Wisconsin was bringing the claim. But then you make the judicial determination that I'm not allowed to ask questions about the plaintiff. That's clear bias. And it prejudices it prejudices my defense. You know also that you have an electronic filing system. I find it hard to believe that I was told yesterday about my um, subpoena for the plaintiff that I had to wait for a filing in a, in a, in a timestamp when I've seen it done numerous times in, in, in just a few seconds right in front of my face. When the prosecution needs something filed, it's, it's filed immediately. I have to wait or I have to wait to the next day. That's a clear bias and a clear prejudice to my defense. Obviously, the court knows that I'm not privileged to the same uh, filing system. Um, which brings me to the reason why 
I brought up the issue of assistance of counsel. Under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to assistance of counsel. It doesn't say anything about representing yourself without assistance of counsel. Having counsel represent you and having assistance of counsel is two totally different things. You, Your Honor, gave me paperwork that was a, a waiver of counsel. We both know that any contract can be altered if I don't agree to certain terms. I crossed out everything in that paperwork that I did not agree or consent to and specifically wrote on that paperwork that I do not waive my right to assistance of counsel. At the very least, I should have been awarded a standby counsel. Not someone to represent me, to speak for me, but someone to help me do things in a timely fashion. Get things filed in a timely fashion. Get motions together in a timely fashion. Make preparations uh, to, to get things done that I don't have the privilege to do in my current situation of being housed at the Waukesha County Jail. I gave you back that paperwork and you accepted the paperwork that I altered that you understood that I didn't agree and consent to those things that were altered. You accepted it and you filed it. That is in the record. I have copies of the same paperwork that you accepted. So when you accepted that, With no objection, that becomes a tacit agreement. But yet, I'm still forced to come in here with zero help. I think it's clear that that prejudiced my defense. Knowing that the prosecution has everything that they need for this matter at, at their fingertips. And I have to jump through every hoop possible to even get things filed in a timely fashion. It was stated for the record that the unit that I'm housed in, in the Waukesha County Jail, and per jail administrator Angela Wallenhoff, that I'm only allowed out of my cell for a few hours a day. So I'm roughly locked down 22 hours a day. Not given the privilege to access everything that I should be able to at, at the time that I should be if I was general population. Arrangements could have been made months ago for me to be at, at least in some form general population with an upcoming trial. Reference was made to being able to use uh, Lexus Nexus or whatever it's called. We call it the law library. That may be the easier way to describe it. I'm only a, a allowed to access the law library at certain times during the day. The rule of the jail is that when you're not in the day room, you can't access the law library, which is on tablets. We are not allowed to have those tablets in our cells. That prejudice my defense. How can I work on my case? How can I look up certain case laws? How can I do any of this if I don't have full access to it?
I even suggested some type of order that could be made by the court to allow me more time out of my cell or to talk to jail administration about allowing me more time out of my cell to be able to use those when needed. And, and to be frank, in a proceeding of this magnitude, there should not be even a time where I'm not access, where I don't have access to, to the materials that I need. If I'm not in the courtroom or sleeping, I should be awarded the time to work on this case, seeing as how I only had a couple days to prepare for a trial of this magnitude. Which brings me back again to the change of venue again. Even right now with trial going on, there's still political ads being shown every day that reference this incident. There's still talk throughout the jail about it. There's uh, been a ton of hate mail received to the jail since the beginning of this. It did die down for, for a little bit, but it picked right back up the closer we got to the trial. Hate mail that comes from people right here in the city of Waukesha. which gives more credibility to the venue needing to be changed. Yet and still that was denied. It's impossible for impartial jury to be found in this county. And that's not the, and that's not to uh, discredit people in the county that can be impartial. It would be unfair to say that no one can be impartial. That, that wouldn't be accurate. But with the level of scrutiny that this whole incident has, the, the reporting, the, the Facebook groups, the, the, the constant, there, there were Facebook groups created because of this. The reporting live stream on, on, on court TV has comment sections where a, a, a lot of insensitive and nasty things are said. The sheer ins insensitivity of, of some of the things that, that are that are said on there. I know a lot of people probably don't care about what I'm about to say, but it still needs to be said because it's truth. The fact of the matter is. Is that I have children, too. Family, too. Loved ones, too. That also have been ridiculed and and. and and had their names drugged to the mud and, and, and have threats towards them. Loved ones that had to leave their home because they were getting threats thrown through their mailbox. Children that didn't feel safe going to school because they were getting bullied behind what was being said. And that's not to sweep anything under the rug whatsoever. To constantly say and report this incident as attack, 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 terrorism, terrorism. It's unfair and it's insensitive. It's a definite Definite tragedy. Definite. And that will never be swept under the rug. There's always going to be healing that, that has to take place.
it's going to be difficult. And that, that should not be swept under the rug. Whatsoever. But it's very insensitive and unfair to not recognize that there, there's many, many, many other victims that never is talked about. And for people to paint a certain picture, mostly from this county, to put this picture out there, it's not only hurtful. But it's insensitive and it's not true. I'm sure the court read through the motion for a change of venue. I'm assuming. Though it was it was. A lot. A lot of paperwork in those motions. I think it was obvious. Obvious that the venue should have been changed. Obvious. It's too many connections and it's too close. It's too close. If there was any chance for a fair trial and an impartial jury, it should not have been in this county. But yet it was denied without any validity. Zero. There's so much bias that's going on that, and even with all this for the record, We still have no proof of jurisdiction. We still have no bond on file in the docket sheet. We still have no plaintiff. We still have no claim. We're not sure of the relationship between you, your honor, and a father of one of the people that was injured. We're not clear on that relationship, no matter how well prepared the speech was, because it was a prepared speech. That was obvious. Where's the proof? I just asked it, that, that same question. Can an affidavit be given that there is no bias, no conflict of interest, and no interest in the outcome of this case? There still is no proof if you hold the full judicial power of the state, or is it the military power? Arguments. You've now repeated yourself a number of times, so I'm going to turn to the state to see if they have any response. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Judge, I'm going to summarize what I just heard by quoting from a case from the Eastern District of Wisconsin, a federal case found at 2022 Westlaw 3045190. Can you repeat that last I'm so sorry. 304-5190. Retzloff versus Moran. The this case is talking about many of the topics that Mr. Brooks has now recited to the court and simply states the majority of Retzloff's filing is incomprehensible jargon 
and cut and paste legal mumble jumble. Sovereign citizen theories are frivolous and wholly without merit. And the court goes on to cite to Bay, B-E-Y, versus the state of Indiana at 847, Fed 3rd, 559, on pages 559 through 560, a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals decision from 2017. Mr. Brooks Objection. knowingly called that name, nor do I know any individual by that name, Your Honor. Please do the courtesy of not interrupting the state as they did not interrupt you for over the almost 50 minutes that you spoke. Thank you. Please continue. Your Honor, the record is very clear that Mr. Brooks knowingly, willingly, voluntarily, and intelligently insisted on representing himself in this trial. He has no constitutional right to stand by counsel, none whatsoever. The court patiently went through the form and advised him of many of the things he's complaining about here today, the resources of the state, the knowledge of the law, his ignorance of the law, and his words to this court, and I quote to the best of my ability, it don't make me flinch one bit. For advising you, and what you need to know, what's important for my conversation with you today is that the state of Wisconsin is represented by three attorneys. Is that a judicial determination? That is not. That's their prosecutorial discretion, sir. So, so they but what, hold on, nope. Let me ask you the questions and tell you certain things. What I want you to know is that the three attorneys appearing on this case have a collective, if I did my math right, 66 years of experience as attorneys. Did you hear what I said? Yes or no? Okay, 66 years of experience as attorneys, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions and I want you to listen carefully. Attorney Opper, yes, has your entire career been as a prosecutor? Yes, ma'am, since 1991. How many intentional homicide cases can you estimate for this court that you've been involved in? Ten. That's just before me. Is that how you took that question or is that total? Oh, I'm sorry, total in the course of my career. All right, so 10 intentional homicide cases that actually went to trial or just prosecuted in general. I wasn't very clear on my question, so. Okay. Uh, I, I would say, Probably eight of those would have gone to trial. Um, this is a ballpark, Judge. Right. Suffice it to say, you are experienced in litigating intentional homicide cases. Yes, ma'am. You're also experienced in litigating reckless endangering safety charges. Yes, ma'am, I've had many cases like that over my career. How many trials do you think you've participated in over your 31 years? I would estimate 200. Attorney Basie, similar questions. You have, I believe, 27 years of experience. I do. All of that as a prosecutor? Yes. Can you estimate for the court how many trials you have? Involved in 125. Be very precise. Any of those intentional homicides? Yes. Any of those involve recklessly endangering safety charges? Yes. Now, Attorney Wichow, you're what we call the baby of the bunch. My understanding is eight years of experience. Yes. All of that as a prosecutor? Yes. Have you been involved in an intentional homicide trial before? No. In addition, Mr. Brooks, first of all, did you hear the answers to the questions I just asked these attorneys? 
Yeah, I heard. I mean, you understand, sir, they have a lot of experience sitting at that table. Would that be fair to say? Do you also understand, though, that they have at their disposal an investigator with the Waukesha County Sheriff's Department? I mean, they're assigned, that person's assigned to the district attorney's office to help them, even during a trial. I don't understand where we're going with this. Just want you to understand the resources that you're up against when you represent yourself. Doesn't make me flinch one bit. And I'm not asking you whether you flinch. I'm asking you if you understand it. I don't. I still go back to the question I asked. I don't understand how they can represent an injured party. How can the state of Wisconsin, the corporate state of Wisconsin, well, be an injured party? I'm not answering that question. Okay, this is, so is a, that a judicial determination that you're not answering. No. That's what he told this court, whatever it was, two weeks ago. Now he's here complaining over and over and over again how unfair this is to him. It's highly offensive. I don't know because, unfortunately, I was talking to my investigator if he ac accused this court of treason, but I certainly heard that word come out of his mouth, and it is absolutely shocking that he would throw such a word around so loosely in this courtroom. This court has been exceedingly patient, exceedingly respectful of his rights at every turn, at every turn. I want to address this claim that he only had three days to prepare for trial. It's absolutely a false statement. The record should reflect that he does have three banker's boxes on his table. The record should reflect that every time the state calls a witness to the stand, he swiftly and easily turns to those boxes, which appear to be alphabetized or organized in some fashion by the public defenders who turned it over to him, and quickly removes the folder of the witness who's testifying and effectively cross-examines that witness using notes from the public defender. We know that because he's tried to confront witnesses with the notes from the public defender. He is not going into this blind or with one arm tied behind his back. They did all the homework and he's simply sitting here reading their notes, reading their cross-examination questions and asking the questions and then going on to his ridiculous questions having to do with his belief in the sovereign citizen movement. There's no way this record would reflect that this defendant is not adequately prepared for trial. He's never asked for a speedy trial. He makes conflicting statements. On one hand, you violated his rights because it's taken us so long to get to the trial. And on the other hand, we're rushing him to this case and he hasn't had adequate time to prepare. He is not, not, not denied access to legal materials in the jail. The record is very clear from the jail administrator. It should not be confused. He misleads this court intentionally to say, I only get out of my cell two hours a day. That is a fact. That is for his own safety so that other inmates do not inflict physical harm upon him. He has access to a tablet. He has access to a computer. Whether he chooses to ask for those resources is up to him. I would also cite the court to U.S. XREL George versus Lane, L-A-N-E, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals at 718 Fed 2nd 226 where a pro se defendant attempted to complain on appeal about his lack of access to a computerized legal research system, paralegal training, or law school education. The court rejected that contention and said, once a defendant has asserted his right to refuse counsel and conduct his own defense, he has no constitutional right to access 
those resources. And again, you warned him, Judge. You fairly warned him. And he basically acted as if you were insulting him and said it didn't make him flinch one bit. Much of the last 50 minutes, which this court has graciously extended him the opportunity to go on and on and on, is nothing more than legal mumble jumble. He's reading from some typewritten transcript. I can see that from where I'm sitting. I don't know who's giving him these materials, but he has an agenda here. It's to stall, delay, disrupt, intimidate, and it's not going to work. Thank you. Objection to that. Um, Your Honor, that's, that's, a, that's a load of crap. Mr. Brooks, that's my opportunity now. I gave you about 50 minutes. I just want to object to, to the, the disrespectful comments that, that was just made. I, I'm not trying to hold you up from what you're going to say, but that's a load of crap. Mr. For, Brooks. for her to sit there. Mr. Brooks. For her to your sit there. Objection is noted. For her to sit it's, there, Your no, Honor. No, it's my turn. Let me let me go through this. I graciously gave you 50 minutes to raise all these various points that you want to bring up. I then gave the state an opportunity to respond. That is the proper procedure. I followed decorum. I followed civility. I did not interrupt you. The state did not interrupt you. Your objection to their characterization, it's noted for the record. I am going to render a decision at this point. Please listen and please do not interrupt. As I indicated, the defendant spoke for about 50 minutes raising a litany of complaints and issues and theories regarding his view of how this case has proceeded. Many of these issues, if not the vast majority or even all of them, have already been addressed by this court in one way or the other. Looking at, for example, his complaints about change of venue, it is true this court denied the change of venue motion. The court made a record at that hearing. I stand behind that record and that decision. The arguments made regarding that decision, which I would note he has yet to file an interlocutory appeal ch challenging that, uh, are nothing more than speculative, without a basis in law or fact. To say that this jury is biased would be a complete miscarriage of justice and a mischaracterization of the process this court painstakingly took in order to obtain a fair and impartial jury. There is absolutely nothing on this record before the court throughout these proceedings to suggest that this is a biased jury. I stand behind my previous determination and the process that this court went through, including initially calling an unusually large panel for which the clerk of court's office sent the initial qualification questionnaire and then ultimately a case specific questionnaire was sent to approximately 1,400 jurors or potential jurors. There was ample opportunity for the parties throughout the proceedings leading up to the end of August to review those materials. There were numerous strikes for cause that this court entertained. Even prior to that specific hearing, the parties met, they conferred, uh, the state agreed not to challenge the vast majority of the challenges to jurors brought by uh, the defense. And then there was the hearing. Uh, then this court uh, at jury selection uh, allowed for 
an indefinite number of strikes for cause. Many were granted, if not all. Uh, and then even on the day that the jurors were brought in, the court provided the jurors with a supplemental questionnaire dealing specifically with the issue of exposure to uh, the political advertisements. And then each, each sorry, party had the opportunity to exercise 10 preemptory strikes, which is well above the number of strikes allowed for by statute, which would be six based upon the homicide charges, one extra for the alternates, which would be seven, but out of an abundance of caution and in the interest of justice, the court gave each side 10, for which many of those Mr. Brooks chose not to exercise and then pursuant to state law, uh, the clerk of court chose names to strike by lot. Again, there's nothing on this record before the court to suggest that this jury that we have is anything but fair and impartial. And I take issue with the characterization that they are anything but. They've been diligent, they take notes, they are attentive, they come to this court as the case law says there's a presumption that they come to the court without bias and it's through the jury selection process that the parties and the court ferret out that bias many of the jurors who were brought in were struck for cause many others were not um, but ultimately we have a fair and impartial jury as I listen to the litany of issues and arguments and complaints raised by Mr. Brooks, I would note that they are all unsubstantiated, conclusory allegations and assertions without an adequate basis raised in law and fact. There have been several misstatements by Mr. Brooks uh, regarding either the record that's been made, items that's been provided to him, or the basis for the court either sustaining or um, sustaining, I should say, or overruling objections, for an example. Um, there's been a mischaracterization of his rights that he claims to have. As I have stated repeatedly, your constitutional rights are not absolute when you're in a criminal trial, meaning your First Amendment right is not unfettered. It is frankly no different why the case law is very clear. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. No one has a First Amendment right to do that. In a criminal case, the parties have an obligation to follow not only the Constitution and the statutes that are applicable, but to follow criminal procedure the rules of evidence. That is what circumscri circumscribes the rights that a defendant or the state has in a criminal trial. The issues you raise, for example, regarding subject matter jurisdiction are baseless, they're frivolous, and they're not anything this court needs to address further. The fact that you now are asking questions about whether this is admiralty court or a military court or a court of competent jurisdiction is frivolous. This court has jurisdiction over the criminal cases brought before it by the state of Wisconsin. In this particular case, these are allegations that criminal conduct occurred in the city of Waukesha. The city of Waukesha is within the county of Waukesha. This court sits as an elected official in the county of Waukesha to hear these types of cases. That is clear. The only argument or relief that I could discern through the course of those 50 minutes was Mr. Brooks's request that this case be dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And as I have just indicated, this court has jurisdiction. It's not been 
let me rephrase that. The issue has not even been raised properly. There's never been a written motion. There's never been even an oral motion that would comport with 80201, which requires that the basis for the relief being requested be stated with specificity and be based in law and fact. The vast majority of the points that you raise, sir, are issues that you can raise on appeal. It is true. You have a right to an interlocutory appeal. I would not be the judge to decide any of those issues. So the fact that you complain about what I do, it's noted the record is going to be very clear. All right. I have a court reporter who's taking down the record of everything that is said and done in this courtroom when we are on the record. And so I don't have to all the time say it's noted for the record because we're on the record. I sometimes do that to hopefully make it clear to you or to note it. I don't always do that, but I'm not required to do that. You raise issues concerning, I guess, plea bargaining. I have never been made aware that you would want to change your plea in this case uh, and that you're not aware of the state wanting to do that. Um, that is the first time any such issue has been raised and I see it as a distraction and as simply a statement made by you as part of the, the litany of things um, that you are not perhaps pleased with. As far as my conduct in this case, I already addressed those issues. I'm not going to revisit uh, issues related to uh, my familiarity with the father of one of the victims that was done very early on. I made a very thorough record and I gave the parties at that point an opportunity to address that after they had ample time to digest that information. While it's true you have a right to seek substitution of judge, it is not unfettered. There was a time limit for that. In fact, it was exercised because judge a prior judge was assigned to this case and your attorneys on your behalf exercise that right of substitution. So to say that you have the right to seek recusal at any time would be a misstatement of the law. And even if you think that should be exercised or there is a valid claim for that, sir, it's not been raised in the proper way before this court. This trial will keep going. I still expect the basic rules of civility and decorum to be followed. That includes, sir, that when there is an objection to a question that you ask, that you wait for the state to indicate their objection and the basis for it. If I need additional information, I will ask for it. If I don't need additional information, I will rule on it. And I do expect that even if you disagree with that ruling, that you will abide by it and that you will move forward. Whether that's asking a new question, rephrasing a question that you've asked, I do ask that you follow that simple rule of decorum, and that's you not interrupt, and then you follow the rules of procedure. As far as the other issues you raise concerning your right to assistance of counsel, the record before this court over the Many days that that topic has been raised, even going back to the two afternoons of hearings this court held, um, I will not revisit those. I believe I honored your request to represent yourself as is required by uh, the Constitution of not only the United States of America, but the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin and that you made a very deliberate choice after being fully 
advised and aware of all the requirements that I needed to go through under the case law, both case law in the state of Wisconsin and case law from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which not only guides this court, but this court must follow. I agree with the state and would um, draw your attention to the two cases that were cited, uh, United States X Rel George versus Lane, found at 718 F second 226, and Retzloff versus Moran, uh, found at 2022 Westlaw 3045190. I let you put on the record all of those points uh, in order to give you that opportunity to make a full record of the issues that you have believed that you are entitled to raise. But those sovereign arguments regarding uh, written findings of fact, bill of particulars, regarding contracts that you enter into, regarding admiralty court, uh, etc., they're baseless, sir. And this court need not address them further. Now with that, I know it's 1130, but I would like to get one more witness on before at least we break for lunch. The jury, of course, has been out for quite some time. So I'll instruct Madam Clerk to bring the jury out. Well, the record, John, you didn't uh, bring up the Higgins Levine 415 U.S. 533 decision. That was that was not addressed in the, the issues are still not addressed. There's still been no proof to anything that you said, anything that the prosecution has said. It still Our hasn't been. is noted and we will continue. Bring the jury out, please. There still hasn't been uh, Mr. Brooks, any proof. I've addressed them there to still the extent that I will. Proof. There still hasn't been any proof. I never once, the comment about me not flinching was when you said that there's 66 years of experience at that table. That's the comment I said, that doesn't make me flinch. That was mischaracterized. That should be for the record. There's still, been no, there's still been no proof. Mr. About Brooks, please stop. I'm not going to address whether there's verified proof or not of jurisdiction, because whether not, there's anything not, along those lines. It is frankly not required under the law. You may disagree with that, you can take that up on appeal, whether that's an interlocutory appeal or whether that's a direct appeal if there is a conviction. But I'm not going to address it any further. Because there's no verified proof. There does not need to be, sir. All right, it I believe the jury is coming out. Is that true? In order, order for a case to... All right, the record should reflect should that the jury is coming out and we are about to continue with the state's next not witness. Once was the plaintiff addressed. That wasn't addressed. Where is the plaintiff? Where is the injured party? That's because the jury will that. disregard the statements presently yeah. being made by the defendant. Because y'all don't want the jury to know the truth. The jury will disregard <coughs> those statements made by the defendant. I see, I see it is not his opportunity to testify. They are comments, on. and as such, are to be disregarded. I see what's going on. Ain't gonna work. All right. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. Not going to work. Attorney Opera, you may call your next witness. Thank you. The state calls Hope Evans. All right. Good morning, Ms. Evans. If you would please make your way to the witness.